I'd like to introduce you to lecture 11, which will be chapter 10 of your book on musculature. I'm going to focus on today is mostly gross uh, muscle structure and the types of muscles that we have. And, and I'm going to give you kind of like a heads up on uh, what muscles we need to know uh, for the practical and also for the lecture exam. Um, in the next lecture, lecture 12, we'll be looking at, at the actual physiology of muscle tissue. So when we look at the muscular system, again, you know, developmentally, it, it forms with the skeletal system and then is um, further supplemented by the vascular system and the nervous system. So we're going to actually look at in this class, what is an actual muscle organ, you know, uh, and then we uh, and what is its structure? And then in the next lecture, we're going to look at how does the individual cells and make up a muscle organ so let's remember again that a muscle is actually an organ made up of tens of thousands of individual cells for an average muscle. And, and guys, the terminology is going to be a little weird. So when we talk about a, a, a muscle cell, they actually call it a fiber. Because in the old anatomy days, when people were dissecting muscles and looking at muscles under microscopes, um, the, the cell itself looked like a fiber. And it was almost indistinguishable from you know, the fibers we learn about through the cytoskeleton. So this is called a muscle fiber. And you're going to see a similar uh, terminology to be used with the nervous system. Matter of fact, muscle, uh, uh, the muscle organ is very similar to the structure of when we look at a nerve. So let us look at the muscle, the parts of it from the outside in. And the first thing you see when you look at a muscle is this connective tissue covering called the epimyceum. The epimyceum it's a continuous connective tissue with the tendon. So we have here is, is um, a, a, a perichondrium, and then we have a periosteum. Now what's different about the epimyceum from the rest of these coverings is that the epimyceum does not contain really any particular stem cells. Unfortunately, muscle cells don't heal. So we don't have a need for any particular type of stem cells, except there are people that do believe that some are present, particularly those for, for skin and for connective tissue. Over the tendon, we find uh, um, fibroblasts and some chondroblasts. And over bone, we find, of course, osteoblasts. Now, something that does happen every now and then is osteoblasts can migrate through this covering into epineurium and unfortunately sometimes cause ossification of the muscle. And this, this occurs in several very rare diseases and also uh, sometimes when the body decays and sometimes when a baby dies in utero, particularly a late term baby. So that's, so know your epimyceum. It is a protective covering for muscle. It's not so much a regenerative covering, covering even though it is responsible for uh, um, epimyceum repair. You know, the epimyceum can repair itself during muscle damage, but it cannot replace dead muscle cells. Now, um, now let's look one step below it. So when we look below the epimyceum, what we see are these structures called fascicles. What this is, is a bundle of muscle cells. Okay, this is a bundle of muscle cells. So we're going to see that this muscle has one, two, three, four, five, and behind there is six fascicles. And we're going to see that each fascicle can be composed of different types of muscle fibers. We'll learn that a little later in the next chapter. But also we see that each fascicle is individually controlled. That means it's controlled by different nerves, okay, and, and sometimes even different types of nerves, which we're going to learn later, uh, that, 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 that make a muscle either work as a whole unit or a partial unit. So that means when you look at a muscle, this fascicle can be doing work, and this fascicle can be doing work and contracting to change that muscle shape and produce a different movement than if all the fascicles are moving. And sometimes what happens, and you can see the fascicles are different sizes, different shapes. Sometimes you'll see if you're picking up something light, that light object can be, uh, you only need a few fascicles to lift. 
when you're lifting a heavy object, that might engage a lot of fascicles. So a lot of what happens when you look at how muscle responds to work, the work is uh, the number of fascicles that determine that work is usually determined by the initial response to a stimulus. So let's say you see a box on the ground and um, you lift it and it feels very light, your brain's gonna say, oh my gosh, and actually a reflex is gonna say, we only need to lift with a couple of fascicles. And sometimes your brain can override that and says, oh my gosh, this box looks heavy. Then you try to lift it with too many fascicles, you end up throwing the box in the air. And the same is true if something looks heavy, I mean, looks light. You might try to put a couple of fascicles to engage. I mean, you know, basically automatically, you, you don't really think about it too much consciously when you control these fascicles, but you try to lift something that's heavy, very light, and just go, oh my gosh, you oomph, and you can hurt your back. So these fascicles are independent units, but they can also work together in a muscle. Now, each fascicle is covered by another membrane called the perimyceum. Epi means to sit upon, peri means a little closer. So the perimyceum is the same type of connective tissue as epimyceum and it surrounds and separates a fascicle. Why does each fascicle need one? So that means if this one undergoes a contraction, any neural signal does not mix over to this one. And that allows them to work independently because what these uh, connective tissue coverings do is they act as an electrical barrier and an environmental barrier. That means it keeps the chemistry and everything particular for that particular fascicle. Now then within a fascicle, Okay, we find individual muscle cells. And each individual muscle cell now is surrounded by what's called an endomyceum. That means the innermost. And what does that do? That makes sure that each individual muscle cell, which can have its own individual nerve now, this gets very complex. And that's why you're going to see, particularly for the appendages, the, the nervous system that innervates the, appendage, uh, the appendages and these muscles that have a lot of this type of control, multifacetal muscles, uh, take a lot of neural control and a lot of control from the motor function of your brain and also little what are called nuclei in your brain that automatically control um, how much work a muscle is going to put into it and the type of action it's going to put into it. So the endomycy makes sure that when one, one muscle cell or one fiber works, other muscle cells will not get a residual. So each muscle cell in here, or muscle fiber, works independently, but also can work in groups, very much like fascicles can. So this is the simple part of understanding muscle structure. But again, know these parts, recognize them on a diagram. So now let's take one muscle fiber, that means one cell out of a muscle, and we're gonna see the anatomy is incredible. A muscle cell or fiber is mostly made up of cytoskeleton, and it's mostly made up of the cytoskeleton that's arranged in these things called sarcomere. Sarco means muscle or flesh, or flesh, muscle or flesh. Near means part. So we're gonna see these little bundles. This is not a cell, this is a and notice it says myofibril. Fiber is the cell. Fibril means little fibers within a cell. So you're going to see these little bundles that you see in the microscope as striations in a muscle cell. They completely fill the cytoplasm, so there's almost no liquid component. It's all fibers that run this way and different fibers that overlap in ways. And then you're going to see fibers that connect the fibers to make these a cohesive unit. And these fibers are contractile. That means they can shrink and be pulled apart. And you're gonna see this when we look at the, the, the um, muscle contraction. This is a fascinating you know, event, but it's also something that you unfortunately have to memorize. So moving on now, when we look at the muscle organ, Muscle organs can be classified several ways. We're going to see by their location, their shape, and also their primary function in the body for a particular body region. That means the, the torso, the upper arm, lower arm, or you know your back. So there are two major types of functional groups of muscle. 
One is called a prime mover. That means this is usually a major muscle that puts most of the force behind bone movement. So you might have a, a prime mover uh, um, elevator in the jaw. You might have a prime mover flexor in your upper arm that flexes the lower arm. You might have a prime mover extender in your upper arm that moves the lower arm. One thing you're going to learn is that muscles tend to move the body part that's more inferior or distal to them, except maybe in the case of the back. This gets a little tricky. Okay, so with now there's another type of muscle called an antagonist. That means it counteracts the effect of a prime mover. So, and sometimes this occurs after a prime mover has done its job or at the same time. And we're going to look at this when we look at types of muscle movement. So an antagonist has the opposite effect of a prime mover. And some people call the prime movers protagonistic muscles. And then you're going to see another type of muscle relationship. Synergist sin means together and erg ERGS means to work. These are muscles that work together. That means sometimes a prime mover needs extra effort. So let's say you in your upper arm, you want to move your lower arm and there's something very heavy. Your prime mover may not be able to help with that movement. So synergists come in to help the job. And also sometimes a movement requires two uh, um, different angles when you're doing a flexion. So you might have a flexion, let's say you're raising your lower arm that might flex to the left or laterally or flex a little to the right medially. And you could just practice this at home. Flex your elbow straight and then flex your elbow at an angle that goes uh, 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 to the outside of the body, your lateral, or one that goes medial to the inside of your body. Twist a little. And these involve also synergists. So this increases the flexibility of movement and also prevents the prime movers from doing a lot of work. And then another group of muscles are called fixators. And these work sort of like synergists, but, in, uh, 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 but also can be working like antagonists in a way. So what a fixator does is make sure when a muscle action is going, that means a flexion is going or an extension, these fixators tighten the bones around them to make sure that one body part moves. And you hear about this athletes talking about this all the time. Oh, do work out this way. And it, and it focuses on one muscle. Now, technically, that's not true. You're always going to engage fixators no matter what you do. Fixators are also very important in posture. They're important in core. When you hear about core, you're talking about a lot of fixator muscles. So they tend to sometimes immobilize bones either for standing, for maintaining posture, or body position, or for balance. You use a hell of a lot of fixators when you're like walking up the steps, where your balance is changing all the time and you're trying to make certain body parts rigid. Fixators are usually under what we call automatic control or autonomic control. And here's the funny thing about synergists and fixators and all that. If you ever try to think about controlling these muscles, it becomes a problem. And I know the, the excellent example is walking up a staircase. If you're not really focusing on it, you can walk up a staircase. But if you try to look at it or try to reason it through, saying, oh, my gosh, i got to lift my leg. Or if you're carrying a big box where your eyes can't see the staircase and now you're totally thrown off about to its present because your eyes are always kind of judging what's going on and helping the muscles automatically communicate. These fixators don't work as well and you become imbalanced. So part of identifying, classifying muscles not only involves the function of the muscle, but also other features. So generally what we do, we can classify muscles according to their function. But when we start naming muscles, that means what you have to memorize in this class, we're going to name muscles based on uh, sometimes location, sometimes on shape, Sometimes an irrelevant size, that means their size compared to sister muscles, usually groups of muscles, and the directions that the fibers or the fascicles run. This is where you have to pay attention to the fascicles of a muscle. And sometimes a name is a blend of these. Now, guys, I did not 
invent this so don't get mad at me. This is because anatomy, remember, had its start in, in the uh, classical Greek and, Gro Greek and Roman, and then eventually in Italian science, and then Germany, uh, Germans and the British and the Dutch all started studying this and each come up with their own names. Then it moved to America and we came up with all names. So this gets to be a nightmare, typical of what you find in anatomy and physiology in the first place. Okay, so, so understand that it really helps to know, you know, sometimes the history of this and the fact that a lot of these names, yes, will be in Latin or Italian, and sometimes in English, sometimes a little German. So another thing that we can do is we can name muscles according to what we call the number of origins. You're going to learn what's called origin and insertion of a muscle. Okay, sometimes the location of attachment we're going to see is a point. And the location of attachment is basically what we call, again, the origin or insertion. So not just a number of them, but what particular bone or region do they attach to? And again, sometimes the action. And not so much a primary move or whatever, but is it a flexor? Is it an extensor? So guys, the naming is complicated. And I, 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 I can't apologize for that because I didn't create it. But, but you know, when we start naming muscles, I'll explain why they get their name. So now let's just look at exactly what is an origin insertion. So let's look at the rectus femoris here. And guys, just to kind of review your Latin here. Okay, rectus means straight, believe it or not. And femoris, this is a term that describes that this bone is, I mean, this muscle is associated with the, the, the femur bone. So this means the straight muscle over the femur, which I mean, Again, this just takes practice in order to remember these names and understanding to use as many clues as possible where these things are found. So when we look at this muscle, okay, it's attached here to the pelvic girdle and it's attached here to three points, patella, because this is your upper leg, okay, patella tendon and the tibia. So what does this muscle do is a question. Now you have to understand the body and typically with appendages, when a muscle is found over a bone, it usually attaches to that bone or another bone above it that means uh, superior to it and it usually moves whatever's inferior to it. That means the bone below it. So the bone has a brace and it has a moving point. So, um, so the origin is the brace. That means what is that muscle attached to to hold it in place for making the movement. The insertion means what is the bone that this muscle is moving. So in this one for the rectus femoris, the pelvis and the femur. It, I, I missed that one. The pelvis and the femur is going to be the attachment point, the origin. That means this is what it's going to be fixed on. The insertion is going to be Primarily the tibia, because you don't want to pull too much on the patella or the patella tendon. So really what you're looking at here is pulling up that lower leg, because this is found anterior. So you're going to move up and it causes an extension of the lower leg. So let us now look at another example. Here's your biceps brachii. This is a prime mover that causes flexion of the lower arm. So where is your origin? And if you already answered that, that's great. If not, and you're waiting for the answer, I'll give it to you. Where do you see these two tendons? They're attached to the scapula. They're both braced on the scapula and a little on, you missed this, but a little on the head of the humerus. The humerus is right under there. And this is called biceps because it has two heads, two attachments points that we call the origin. So that's your origin. Now, what is this inserting on? What's the insertion? So you have your radius and your owner, and you can see the attachment point is your upper part of your forearm muscle, uh, bones. And what happens when this muscle contracts, just like when that muscle contracts, you get this flexor motion. So 
be able to recognize, and I'll tell you which muscles you need to do this, to understand origin and insertion. Now, something that helps you to understand the strength of a muscle and the name of a muscle and also the direction that that muscle works sometimes is by looking at the arrangement of fascicles. Because this, this is the thing you see really in a muscle. You see those, those little bundles of fascicles, because especially when you work out a muscle and make it really big, sort of like, you know, good old Schwarzenegger, um, you'll see that you can see they're kind of like the rippling in his muscles or the definition in the muscles. These are not just distinct, you know, showing distinct individual muscles, but also development of those fascicles. And depending on how the person builds up those muscles or uses those muscles, certain fascicles get bigger than others as they are worked. This is called hypertrophy, and hypertrophy can be temporary or permanent depending on the use of that muscle. And this is why muscles are a giveaway of what a person does and what type of uh, ergonomics is associated with what they do. That means the motions uh, uh, that they, they use for everyday life. So there's going to be something called a circular muscle. And we're going to see that the fascicles are in a concentric ring. Don't confuse this with something called a sphincter. We'll cover, you'll cover that in when you get into the digestive system. Then there's what are called convergent fascicles. That means that the, that the fascicles look like they're coming from a broad point and coming together. We've got to pay attention to the origin and insertion on these. So that means that, um, and, and you'll see what I mean when we start looking at these. I'll give you picture examples. And then some muscles have a, a fascicle arrangement called parallel. Usually these are muscles that just do general work. They can be fixators. And I'll explain that as we look at these. They're a fusiform, and fusiform just means shaped like a spindle. You'll see a fair amount of these. That means the fascicles are kind of like spindle shape. And then you have pennate. That means the fascicles, you'll see this kind of come out this way from a central area of the muscle. And again, I'll show you this. Pennate means looks like a feather. It comes from the word pen, which pen actually meant pennate made from a feather. That was the old, 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 old days. Okay. So let us look at these muscles. So here's a circular muscle. Look at the fascicles. They go all the way around. And sometimes these fascicles look like this. It's two sets of fascicles that sometimes connect in the middle to a skin attachment point. So, and I'm never going to ask you the origin and insertion of a circle muscle because it's very difficult to, to think about. I mean, we can figure it out, but the type of movement they make is very unusual. And usually when we deal with a circular muscle, we call it an, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, an orbiculus muscle. Orbiculus just kind of means circular. Oris means the mouth. So an example of a circular muscle will be the orbiculus oris, which kind of moves, uh, opens and closes your lips. So let us look at a convergent muscle. That means the fibers are focusing together. Now, again, you have to know origin and insertion. So when we look at the convergent, this is your pectoralis major, your major chest muscle. Major means it's the biggest of the, um, the group of test, uh, chest muscles. And we're going to see chest muscles come in pairs. Uh, uh, gluteal muscles come in three. Okay. And, and, and we're going to see major, minor, and sometimes uh, medialis when we start talking about these. So um, when we look at the pectoralis, your sternum's here. That's medial. And what happens is the pectoralis uses the sternum as a brace. That means it's holding on for dear life. And its contraction is going to move the upper arm, which means it's probably going to be attached maybe a little to the scapula, but probably also to the top of the humerus, because there's your humerus right there. And by pulling on that, it extends the humerus. It actually makes the humerus go through a little um, abduction away from the body. Okay, and, and that takes literally the whole arm and part of the shoulder with it. So why is this convergent? Because convergent means to come together because the fascicles come in like this. That means this is a bunch of pulling power all focused together. The best way to think about that is think of you have a person here 
a person here and their head isn't they, they just have a weird body in general okay um, a person there and they're all pulling and causing this feature to move that's putting a lot of strength into one focal point that's called convergent that's how you know the pectoralis major is a prime mover and it's a very strong muscle because you're taking all this force and pinpointing it on a tiny tiny little focal point let us look at a parable a parallel muscle so all the fascicles are going straight line and usually these muscles are kind of flattish in a way they have an equal size insertion equal size origin and it's sometimes hard to tell the origin and the insertion if you're not familiar with the body and there's one right there that's your sartorius muscle sartorius means basically the uh, 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 um a a holder for a strap or for a sword okay and that's in the old days when they used to carry a sword and a strap and it kind of hang down like that now we have what are called single feather muscles unipennate look at that looks like a feather like a half a feather one half is missing and we find these we're going to see in the um um what are called the extensor digitorum muscles and that's found here and you're going to see a set here these must what these muscles do is again they're pretty much for strength but also regulation so think about the, the incredible control over having you you fold your your fingers or your toes but particularly your fingers you can move your fingers very slightly slowly and partially and sl you could also wrap your fingers real quickly you can take your fingers and form a light grip you can take your fingers and form a heavy grip and what happens is each muscle fascicle is under individual control to cause a different type of extension or flexion because we also have what are called uh, flexor digitorum and these could and the flexion extension could act as antagonists that cause different types of grades of movement and different speeds of movement based on the number of muscle fibers that are engaged so all of these fascicles can work independently as one or in groups here's a bipinnate so what happens is you have two little feathery things like that so there's actually a central piece here that each has a feather so if you look at each of these muscles up close they actually look like this the fascicles go like that this has to be two bipinnate that work together as one and that's kind of freaky okay so with the bipinnate the rectus femoris is one of those muscles okay this is this basically means the muscle that helps to straighten up things it's a straight looking muscle too um fusiform the muscle body is like this and you have a very small origin a very tight insertion these also tend to be kind of stronger muscles but they're probably more uh, 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 they're more directed in what they do so these are focus movement these are these are not as strong as, as the convergent but they still create a lot of strength but you can also see in their design they're usually assisted by other muscles and then there's the multipennate and this is kind of a weird one it's often confused with the convergent but it works the same way this is actually uh, um, various pennate muscles and these happen to be bipennate also so you take several bipennate and maybe a unipennate and glue them together in a clump so now all of these are like you know fascicle you know fascicles that have a broad origin small insertion your origin here will basically be uh, part of the scapula your clavicle most of your upper shoulder and the insertion would be your humerus and what this does is it helps to elevate the humerus and, and, and it works with the pectoralis major to create a variety of movement so this is also a strong muscle it serves a very similar purpose to the convergence and sometimes we call this muscle by its shape also the deltoid you can see delta means triangle 
So know this. These are very important terms that help you to understand the muscle. And again, know basically the major ones you need to know are going to be circular, because this will be a very common one, convergent, bipinnates, fusiforms, and parallel. I don't want you to know, uh, you know, because the unipinnates are going to be very specific, and the multipinnates are going to be very specific. It doesn't mean you don't know those muscles. We just don't have to get tested on these. So now, muscle mechanisms. Understand that a muscle is a machine. That means what a muscle is doing, it, it, it's creating movement, sort of like what we call a lever or a lever system. So we base our body on common machines that cause a lever, that means a movement of a distance, or a rotation, because we have motors that cause rotation. But for most of your appendages, we're going to see we're going to have this lifting device that we call a lever. So what we're going to see, a lever needs a brace. That means it needs something to fix onto so that when we're moving something else, we have this brace. A lever has to have effort. That means it has to be force coming in. And this is going to be the direction and the strength of the muscle contraction. And then there's a load. That means this is where the muscle inserts. And what is going to be that, you know, it connected to. And this load is going to be the muscle or the tissues that it is going to move and whatever is associated, like something if you're lifting, with that bone or tissue. So now let's look at how this fulcrum works. So this is called a class, a, a first class or a class one lever. Don't worry about the classes. We're just going to look at three examples to see how this works. So, uh, so to understand what's going to be the fulcrum, that means the point that we're moving, what's going to be the load, that means the direction of movement, and what's going to be the effort, again, meaning, again, we're taking this load and moving it. What are we doing here? Where we're putting the effort. So understand that, first of all, you know, the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Okay, where does the term come from? Sterno means its origin. The sternum, that's the immovable bone. Because think about it, sternum is immovable. Okay, I mean, it's braced in there, locked in there. The mastoid process of the temporal bone is going to be the insertion. So, you know, that's going to be the part that moves. And your load is going to be the head. That's what we're going to be moving. And we're going to see in kind of like a flexion position. Okay, that's going to bend the head sort of back and down to the side laterally because you have two sternocleidomastoids that move either left or right. Okay, what this muscle is going to do is going to contract from about this size to about that size. So that means it's going to shrink in length, which means it's going to cause this type of movement where the head's going to kind of twist along this effort. So the effort's going to be going down. This is how we predict muscle movement. Now let us look at what we call a second class lever. Okay, and now we've got to assess the situation. So here's the lower leg. Remember in the appendicular skeleton, the muscle is usually moving what's inferior to it. So what this muscle is going to do is somehow move the, the uh, foot either up or down in this case we're going to see that in a minute okay so look at the insertion that means what is this muscle move uh moving and look it's a it's attached to the talus and also to the phalanges partly and to the tarsals so this is the part that's going to be moving okay so this is your insertion the origin is going to be all the way up to the upper part of your lower leg and maybe even higher. So that's going to be your origin. And the muscle in length is going to be like this long. It's going to go off your chart. And it's going to shrink to about this size, which means as that shrink, the effort is going to go in this direction. Okay. And your actual load is, uh, um, you know, going to be lifting that foot up 
because contraction lifts this up. It shrinks and moves that up. So don't worry. The load looks like it's going to go in the opposite direction of the effort. Don't worry about this. This is what it means by first, second degree. I just want you to be able to predict what is going on here. So your load is basically going to be, you know, getting this whole body off the ground. Next, and don't worry again about a third class lever. But again, let's predict what's going on here. So now this is uh, um, your biceps brachii. Okay, your major muscle. And remember the type of fascicle arrangement it is that you see there. Okay, now um, let us look at the origin. That means what is this muscle attaching to? Because it is in the the upper arm, which means it's moving the forearm. Okay, it moves the distal part. It braces to the part that is proximal. So this muscle is attached um, usually to the clavicle and to the, uh, the um, scapula. And maybe a little chunk of it may be found around the joint where the humerus comes in. But this is to be your major brace. Okay, so that means that this is the fixed point. Contraction means your effort's going to go here because you're going to shrink that muscle the functional muscle from about this size to that size. And that's where you get that nice little, you know, boop in the muscle, which makes it look fatter. Okay, that's why when we want to look at how big that muscle is, you kind of uh, flex your arm because that's going to be a flexion motion. So what happens is that the effort goes there, the load is pushing down on that, but you're going to move against it. And your fulcrum is going to be right here. So there's your insertion. And that's going to be the lower arm muscles. And usually you're going to brace on that uh, um, um, electron process area of your owner because that's your brace muscle. The radius is more for rotating. So the, um, the owner is going to be more of your fixating stable muscle, at least for the motion, the movement. So to reiterate, when we start having to memorize muscles, make it easy on yourself and look at the information that's in the name of each muscle. So look at the name and I mean, you know, know the name and the description. Pay attention when you look at the muscle, know the origin and insertion. Because the name basically and description basically tells you where it is in the body. And you can look at the body and actually say, oh my gosh, it's over a bone. So if you know your skeletal system, you know the body regions, you can kind of be able to name that muscle. But particularly also knowing where the origin insertion is. Know the action of that muscle. And, and particularly uh, um, some muscles, you need to pay attention to the innervation. I'm not going to hold you to that. But, uh, you know, some instructors want you to know the major nerves for that. So in class, you're going to be adding a list of muscles that you need to at least to be identified on either the whole body, on diagrams, or on models, or like just a, a, um, a portion of an arm or the torso, or I could have just a, a head, and you look at the muscles on the head. So, uh, and for some of them, you're going to have to know uh, origin and insertion and their movement, but that will all be on the list that accompanies this assignment. So basically, don't be overwhelmed by all the muscles here. I mean, don't get overwhelmed by that. There's lots of names. But the ones with the uh, blue dots you see here from the frontal view are the ones you need to know. So, you know, so pay attention to these. And some of these are going to be part of one muscle. So, for example, the epicranius has what's called the frontal belly. And you only see it from the front. We're going to see in the next slide from the posterior view, you're going to see another portion called the occipital belly. So take, and, and you're going to see some of these from different angles, and they might appear differently depending if you're looking at it from laterally, anteriorly, posteriorly. So look at the dots. These are the ones that you definitely need to be able to recognize. Okay, and um, at least for some of them, know the um, general origin and insertion or the type of movement that they create. This is looking at the posterior. I didn't do all the uh, duplicates, but you can see from the posterior side, we're going to have the major back muscles, the, the hip muscles, and some of the rear leg muscles. And, and these are called deep muscles. That means they're deeper in 
below the um, what's called the superficial muscles. So we have the uh, and um, so we're gonna have to know the erector spiny because these are very important muscles. Okay, for for posture, for core, and basically um, just for general movement of the head and the whole back himself, they have a very important role in the body. And this is where you find a lot of uh, back ache and back pain. Um, when we look at the arm itself, you're going to see close-ups of this to look at what are called the extensor and digit and flexors. And this you have to tell for whether the body is in the anatomical position. So you have to pay attention to um, where that thumb is and where that radius and ulna are to tell if they're an extensor or flexor. In this case, they're a flexor. That means that um, they're making the, the, the fingers clamp up. And in this case, we have the extensors, which actually straighten out the fingers. But notice I'm not going to ask you um, all of these. Okay, so the, the main one's going to be the extensor digitorum, which we just saw earlier. And in the lower leg, we're going to have a close up. Now, the problem is you're going to have um, um, some of these muscles are going to be kind of hidden a little, but I will have them so you can see them, particularly the asaurus. And you're going to see the quadriceps group. I want you to basically know the quadriceps group, which was on the first slide showing the um, uh, anterior view. But, this, but understand that this is made up of a group of three muscles that work together and you should at least be able to recognize that they belong. So this is looking at the posterior of upper leg. And as mentioned earlier, you need to know the gluteus medius and maximus. This is your prime mover. Okay, and we're going to have to know the hamstring group. Just know that these belong to it, but you don't have to identify them separately. And this is looking at the uh, lateral view of your lower leg. You should be able to know that because look at your little toe and be able to recognize um, your gastrocnemius and your, and your soleus, which is also visible from the posterior view of the lower leg. And here's a close up of the uh, abdominal region. You're responsible for the rectus abdominis. And notice those uh, tendons there that help to make this muscle uh, give a graded gentle bending. This actually flexes the, abdominal, the abdomen forward. And you also have to know the external oblique, which is right here. There are, I'm not going to make you know the internal ones because you don't really see them. But this is your prime mover, and the internal ones assist that. They're synergistic or could be fixators sometimes. Um, and then this is a close-up of the head, the side view. So you're going to have to know, of course, this. But that was mentioned earlier in the posterior view. And this shows a better view of your orbicularis oculi. This actually shows your... Uh, Buccinator right there, that means a cheek. Buccus means cheek. Uh, the old buccaneers meant they carried a little pouch to look like a cheek. Okay, or cheek to look like a pouch, actually. It's kind of a little reverse there. Your orbicularis oris, that's one of your circular muscles. There's your platysma. And guys, on most of our images, we remove the platysma so you can see the underlying muscles, and people forget about that one. But there's your sternocleidomastoid right there, and there's one you don't have to know called the sternohyoid which is right there. Let's look at your rib cage because these are hard to see because they're buried by the other muscles. So these are called your internal intercostals. Look at them, they're anterior. That's your anterior part of your, and notice that um, their position. And then your external, notice that they lay towards the back and these are involved in rib cage expansion, particularly in the breathing process. And then this is a transverse cut right at the bottom of the rib cage looking up. That means from the inferior to the superior. So this is going to be your uh, diaphragm, which is one of the muscles you have to know. It's very difficult to see in a, di in a diagram because it's hidden. So if I do show a diaphragm, it would be a symbol like this. I mean, an image like this. And I will point out where it is in the body. So pay attention closely to the sheet that you're handed out in class that tells you what you need to know about the musculature.